Assalamu alaikum. I'm your host, Ak El Mumin. Welcome to another episode of In the Line of Fire. Today we have with us a special guest. Uh, her name is, or her title is Assistant Minister, and her name is Samadia Shabazz, and she is the Assistant Minister of the Decatur, Georgia Mosque. Assalamu alaikum, Minister. Wa alaikum salam, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you? It was, uh, I'm very, I'm doing well. Good. I'd like to welcome you to our show. Uh, it was a pleasant surprise that you stopped by. Uh, you look lovely today. I'd like to say that. Thank you. This is a surprise for me as well. Okay. So as I was saying, I was introducing to the audience that um, we we here do this show. Uh, our minister is Minister Mustafa Salim of the Decatur Georgia Mosque under the leadership of the Honorable Silas Muhammad. Yes. Sir. Uh, the people are aware of our minister from time to time. He's our special guest. He comes on. Um, he founded this show for us. Uh, and, you know, like, it, this is a show about Afro-descendants. It's a variety show. We deal with different issues that we discuss. But today I wanted to show another side of our mosque. Yes, sir. And I wanted to show that, uh, you know, a little more how we structured. And I wanted to introduce you to the people. You are the assistant minister of the Decatur Georgia Mosque under the leadership of Donald Salas Muhammad. And um, I want you to tell the people a little bit about yourself. Uh, introduce yourself. Okay. Um, well, like you stated, I, my name is Samadia Shabazz, um, <clears throat> and I am honored to serve as Minister Mustafa Salim's assistant minister. I have been registered in the Lost Foundation of Islam for about 17 years, and I have been steadfast in my service to the Nation of Islam ever since. Um, I've, I've worn a few hats and held a few positions. Um, I was minister at Headquarters Mosque um, from about June of 96 until 97 when I relocated to Miami, Florida. So uh, what inspired you to become a minister in the Lost Foundation Islam? Well, <clears throat> quite honestly, I, I was not particularly or necessarily inspired to become a minister. Um, shortly after I registered in the nation, I think because I was very active and um, would attend all the meetings and was pretty studious, there came a time when the minister at that time needed an assistant and um, had someone to approach me about assisting him in his department. And so I, I did, and I've been in a minister's department ever since. Okay. Um, it, you know, like, to the world that doesn't know, I want to move to another issue. Yes. Um, as you know, we refer to ourselves as contemporary Muslims, and we make a distinction between ourselves and the Orthodox Muslim world, or that world which follows um, the teachings of Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him, uh, from Arabia. Um, of course, our messenger, or our last messenger, is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I want to, from a contemporary Muslim woman perspective, I want you to shed some light on being a minister um, as far as, you know, in the old world, the chauvinist tendencies, you know, women are blocked or, or not encouraged to be in the public eye and, or to um, do the same thing that a man would do, or, you know, the, the stereotypical chauvinistic stuff. Um, Master Farah Muhammad brought us freedom, justice, and equality. That's part of our flag. So, and freedom, justice, and equality, is, it includes everybody. So, and this issue that I want to deal with is between brothers and sisters or men and women. And the, uh, the or, how do we differ from the Orthodox world from your perspective um, and, and the rights of women and, and holding a position such as a minister of the Lost Financial Islam? Yes, sir. Well, I, I must say that um, growing up, I always... Uh, felt strongly about receiving my rights as a female. Um, I grew up in a single family home here in Atlanta with one sibling, and that sibling is a brother. 
So um, not much at the hands of my mother, but at the hands of my grandmother, I felt like I experienced discrimination. Um, I, I thought that my brother was allowed to do things that I wasn't allowed to do for no reason other than he's a boy and I'm a girl. Um, and so I always had strong feelings about that. I always wanted to be acknowledged and recognized for my mind. I remember having that specific thought, even as a very young child in elementary school. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to be smart. My thoughts were always with what schools I was going to, what careers I would have, um, as opposed to dreaming about my wedding day or things that are typically or stereotypically girly. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I most appreciated about the teachings of the Honorable Silas Muhammad um, was the teaching of freedom, justice, and equality, and the fact that it was applicable to not just the men, but to the women. Um, women, we don't have as many women ministers as we do have men ministers, um, but it's not because having women ministers is not encouraged or allowed. I received no backlash or no problems or issues being the minister at headquarters mosque, at our headquarters here in Atlanta. Uh, I think that as a woman, the fight and struggle for freedom, justice, and equality um, reaches another level than it does even with my brothers, my FOI, um, in the nation, in that even among brothers and sisters, uh, the, the, the stereotypical uh, roles and the culture from the outer world or the dead world um, kind of trinkles in a little bit into the new world, or at least to the nation of Islam today. Um, and that is brought in by the believers, not by the teachings of the Honorable Silas Muhammad. Um, so I, I appreciate greatly the fact that sisters have the opportunity, the right, and even the duty to hold posts and positions in the nation of Islam, um, as well as brothers, be it um, the position of minister, assistant minister, investigator, uh, secretary, be you enlisted in the military or not. Uh, in fact, the Honorable Silas Muhammad um, is teaching us that a nation can rise no higher than its woman, and that a woman is the nation's greatest asset, as taught the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be upon him. And indeed, I ag agree. I agree with that. But more so, he's put that teaching and that belief into practice. Um, with the structure and setup of our government, of our nation, um, whether it's the local mosque, mosque stru structure or even the governmental structure on a national level. Um, in particular, women in, in the body of the government have a leadership role, um, one that stands above the role of the men. Um, within the legislature. And the Honorable Silas Muhammad has taught us that we will go back home with the woman out in front as, as managers, as entrepreneurs, as business women making things happen. And uh, I think that's great. It's appropriate. It fits the characteristics and traits of a woman um, in that we typically uh, have an innate ability to multitask, um, to departmentalize, whether it's our minds or jobs. We are um, managers, naturally, and I love and appreciate the fact that the Honorable Silas Muhammad does not seek to hold us down, or anyone for that matter, brothers either, but particularly women, and um, women across cultures throughout the world for centuries have been held down, and that is not a practice that we continue. And it is fitting because freedom, justice, and equality isn't just for men. It's for everyone. I want to um, dwell 
or go f- deeper in a, in a point that you're bringing up. And, uh, and it's kind of like, I'm going to zoom out. And uh, in, a lot in our audience, and I need, we need to address this issue, a lot of the people that were under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they feel like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the seal. He was like the volume of er- all the prophets and, and, and the fulfillment in the books, both the Bible and the Holy Quran. And they feel like uh, they don't fully understand Mr. Muhammad, the Honorable Silas Muhammad. So I want to stress the difference that we are not the lost foundation of Islam under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be upon him. We are the second resurrection of the lost foundation of Islam. And as Mr. Muhammad teaches, that he's not redoing the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, which was destroyed by his son Wallace. He's doing a new resurrection. And in this resurrection, things are different. So a lot of the first rise Muslims, brothers and sisters, when they look in our camp, when they don't see that exact duplicate or, or that um, the same thing that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad set up, they feel like we're not real contemporary Muslims. So we're not the FOI and the MGT and GCC that the message is set up. So I wanted you to, from your perspective, to deal with differences. For example, uh, in the first rise, uh, the, the sisters, even though grown women, they were referred to as MGT. And MGT stands for Muslim Girls Training. Uh, I know there was an issue that your sisters brought up in the second rise that, uh, you know, we are not girls. We are women. And this, you, you stress the second part of the, of the training for women, GCC. And that stands for Ge- General Civilization Class. So I wanted you to break down why is it that you all voted and decided to call a general civilization class? What does that mean? How do you view what you bring to the nation? And how does is this different under the Honorable Silas Muhammad versus how it was in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's time? And then I, I will I want to ask you a couple more things re- up under that, but I'll let you um you know answer this you know. Yes, sir. Well, first point. I want to say that. Um, Per my observation, we are more like um, the first rise as far as following the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be upon him, to the extent that we haven't strayed from them or changed them, the basic teachings, um, teachings as in we don't vote, teachings of separation, America is falling, um, we don't actively participate in America's political system that we hold true to. Um, and so the general teachings we follow very closely as compared to other other groups um, of Muslims that may be out there. But as it pertains to women in particular, I do know that in the first rise, um, women um, covered themselves and <clears throat> Because of the role that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be upon him, played, um, and because of the fact that Islam came to the West, particularly America, uh, via Master Farad Muhammad, Almighty God, Allah, to whom praises are due forever. And for the sake of distinguishing us as Muslims, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, peace be upon him, dressed the women like the Muslim women dressed in the East so that we would stand out as Muslims. However, um, that attire, I mean, as you can see how, <clears throat> how I'm dressed this evening, we don't carry on any longer. First of all, it's, a, it's an expression of freedom. Um, while contemporary Muslim women, um, particularly the followers of the Honorable Silas Muhammad, do dress modestly, um, we don't cover ourselves from head to toe. And that tradition um, became a part of the culture as a result of man not having discipline um, and self-control. And instead of developing and mastering himself and developing the discipline to be respectful and civilized towards women, instead of doing that, he instead ordered women to cover up. So he put the responsibility of self-discipline on the female, which was unfair. Um, And it's not an expression of freedom, justice, or equality. Um, In the first rise, um, in, in readings, 
and documentaries that I have um, observed and read, they the sisters used MGT slash GCC, all of it, Muslim Girls Training General Civilization class. And it would be, we were known as MGT when I first came into the Nation of Islam as well. While the name, the title, was a little uncomfortable for me at the time, MGT, Muslim Girls Training, and we were all women in class, it, while it made me feel a little uncomfortable, the teachings and the practices and the culture that we were establishing within the nation didn't make me feel like a girl. And so I was willing to accept the, the title, the name, um, knowing that it was a part of the practice of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, in about 2000. Four, I believe it was 2004 the Honorable Silas Muhammad came down to headquarters mosque and uh, it may have even been 2003 because I, I, don't, I wasn't there and um, I believe I was still in Miami at the time and I moved back here in November of 03 so it was in 03 I believe that he went to headquarters mosque and met with the sisters and decided that we would be referred to just by the name GCC. And I think that perhaps he had heard complaints or concerns or murmurs of dissatisfaction from the sisters about being referred to as girls. And um, understandably so. Uh, and him being um, the man that he is and willing to submit to truth and being fair-minded and, and justice-minded as he is, I imagine gave serious thought to perhaps being called a girl um, in the ranks of the Nation of Islam is as insulting as being called a boy in the ranks of FOI would be for the men. And thus, we now use the term MGT for our girls' training, for our young girls who are in class. And once you reach the age of 18, they transition over to GCC. I think another reason why he began to address us as GCC was to bring to the forefront of our minds the fact that we are the civilizers and there's a duty and responsibility inside of being the civilizer. When I first came in and we were referring to ourselves as MGT, it was just MGT. We didn't say MGT GCC. It was just MGT. And being referred to as GCC, I believe, puts on the forefront of your mind the fact that this is general civilization class, that we are the mothers of civilization, and we have the duty to civilize. So it puts on my mind um, the necessity to master self and to be civilized because we have a duty to civilize the earth. And I think having that in our name um, causes us to be even more mindful of that and elevates us to a moment where we are qualified to genuinely carry out that role. How do you view, um, like this structure that we have? And, you know, the decayed Georgia Mosque is a new mosque. It's exciting. We we're building from the ground up. Um, like, how do you view our mission and our direction as in this mosque? And one thing I'm, I I I, sh I want to reiterate that I love how the minister structured the mosque. As far as you're the assistant minister, um, well, basically you're the other minister. And Minister Mustafa is a minister, so it's like a man and a woman minister. You're you're sharing in in uh, in holding the post. Yes. And and by the way, like you said, if as long as brothers and sisters are qualified, it could be the other way around. It could be the head minister is the sister minister, and the assistant minister is brother minister. Yeah, so it was that way once before. Right. And so I was minister at headquarters.